Hello, and welcome to this Sonodyne Soundwaves podcast on navigation. I'm Aidan Thorne. I'm the Marine Robotics Business Development Manager at Sonodyne, and it's my great pleasure to be here at the National Oceanography Centre today uh, to talk about navigation and its importance to AUVs. This is our second episode on navigation. In our first episode, we talked with our colleagues at McGill University and our sister company, Voice, about some novel applications and developments in navigation there that we're working on with them. And today we have the privilege of the company of Alberto Consensi from the Mars Group here at the NOC. Alberto, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, please just start by telling our listeners and our audience a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, first of all, Aidan. And good morning, everyone. And good morning to you. And thanks for having me. Um, like you said, my name is Alberto Consensi. I am a robotic system engineer and delivery lead here at the National Oceanography Center. Um, my background is in underwater robotics, uh, navigation and control system design. I'm working within the Marine Autonomous and Robotics System Development Group here at NOC. And as a delivery lead, my role is to take um, the, the technical lead of projects advancing autonomous capabilities for autonomous vehicles. So for all the underwater autonomous vehicles operated at NOC. Fantastic. No, it's great to have you today and thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, so one of the things that I can say as a former employee of the National Ocean Obvious Center is, you know, going back to the year 2000 when I started here at the NOC, there was one AUV here, the Auto Sub AUV. And of course, we look around this fantastic facility that you've got here now and we see lots and lots of vehicles all around and different shapes, different sizes, different capabilities. So obviously, that auto sub story has grown considerably over the last 24 years, but obviously it goes back further than that as well. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the auto sub vehicles? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Um, so the auto sub program uh, has been developing world class NUVs since uh, the late 80s. So when we say world class, we mean um, a short range, high powered AUVs. And we had over the years a really good example so really really interesting missions uh, for instance under the antarctica under the antarctica ice shelf uh, in in the weddell sea and that was out of sub 3 uh, exploring the under ice as well as out of sub 6000 um, identifying the uh, most uh, deep uh, hydrothermal vent in the world at that time um, throughout the years uh, the program has been diversified and ultra short long range AUVs has been developed. So these are now part of the ALR family. So out sub long range, otherwise known as you as you know, as both in like both face. Yeah. Um, most recently, we also developed a new experimental vehicle uh, and a hover capable vehicle, which is called AH1, out sub hover one, that um, of course completes the, the out sub family. So all the AUVs that are operated by NOC, they fall into the out sub program. Fantastic. and. As I say, there was one vehicle when I joined. Um, how big is the Mars fleet today? It's not just AUVs, is it? There's lots of other vehicles. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of vehicles. So in terms of AUVs, at the moment, NOC currently operates six ALRs. Uh, three of them are 6,000 uh, 6, meters rated, and three of them are 1,500 meters rated. Uh, we operate one uh, world-class AUV, which is up sub-5, as well, like I said, AH1. On top of that, we have a family of gliders. Uh, these are not developed internally by us, but they're off the shelf um, uh, platforms. Um, and we have a large family, probably we operate 30 plus gliders, as well as ROVs. At the moment, we have, we have three of them. Uh, one is an experimental platform, the other two are well established. Fantastic. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time walking around some of the vehicles today, um, particularly the Auto Sub Long Range, Auto Sub 5, and the auto sub hover vehicles, because those are the vehicles that are actually using Sonodyne navigation uh, payloads on board. Um, and it's nice to see that across all of your fleet of vehicles that you've got in, in the AUV fleet, um, Sonodyne has been selected for as a navigation solution across all of the different fleets. And I know that you also use other, other organizations, other, other companies, uh, navigation payloads as well, but it's good to see that we've, we've managed to um, add the value to, to a number of your vehicles, which is good. Um, what I would like to start by doing is talk about why navigation is really important, specifically to AEVs. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, across all the AEVs that we operate at NOC, uh, navigation and localization are two, probably the two most important tasks for a mobile robot. Of course, navigation is an extension of the localization problem. You need to localize an AUV. So an AUV needs to know 
where it is in order to operate in the in the surrounding environment. And once that problem is is solved, then you can focus on how you navigate, so how you move with respect to the environment that is that is around you. If you think about that, the, the, there is an even increase in demand of operating AUVs in really challenging environment like littoral and coastal water, um, under ice, uh, GPS denied uh, scenarios, or in areas where there is a high density of shipping lines. So this problem becomes crucial. Uh, so we can't ignore this problem. We need to use the, the best technology available uh, to, to, to solve this problem. Um, of course, different AUVs, they have different needs. Uh, for ultra short, uh, uh, long range uh, vehicle, there's always a trade-off between uh, use of power, of the budget power that is available in the vehicle, uh, and the other opposite for world-class vehicle that they can stay out for um, 36 hours max probably. Uh, we have plenty of power that we can use uh, uh, for navigation. So it really depends what is what is the purpose of what is the, the, the specific mission for the AUV. Great. So I think what we probably need to do now is go and have a look at some of these vehicles. So uh, obviously many people use podcasts uh, whilst they're running, walking around. So it's, it's in your ears. Uh, we are going to be doing a tour. This will be um, largely visual, but I'm going to make sure that when we talk into Alberto today, we do uh, describe the things that we're looking at as well. So if you're looking at it on YouTube, great. You're going to see all of the video footage. You're going to see the vehicles that we're talking about. But please do go online afterwards. We're going to put some uh, show notes in as well that show links to the various vehicles, send links to the National Oceanography Centre web pages and things like that. But yeah, we're going to take a look, walk around the vehicles now and talk about the different vehicles, the different capabilities of them and the different navigation scenarios that might be needed for each of those vehicles. So let's go and uh, do that now. Absolutely. Let's go. Well, Alberto and I are stood in front of the skeleton of an AUV. It's really interesting to see this in this state. For those of you listening at home, we've got uh, the skeleton of Autosub 5 in front of us. And Alberto, this is the latest Autosub to be introduced into the family. Is that correct? That's correct. So Autosub 5 is the last entry of the Autosub program. It's a world-class AUV. That means that is a high-powered, short-range AUV usually launch and recover from a ship. Um, it can stay out at sea for probably up to 48 hours. Um, but what is really um, uh, crucial for this platform is that it has a um, really high budget power um, and therefore it can operate and it can host really, really um, high performance navigation platforms and um, also um, science sensors. Okay, and in front of us, we've got one of our Avtrak uh, transponders. So this is used as part of the USB L system. And uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. So you have a Sony on USB L system on board the ship, talking to the Avtrak on board the vehicle, correct? That's correct. So Sonardyne uh, devices are um, in all the platforms that we operate as well on the ships. Uh, so both uh, James Cooks and Discovery, they are the two uh, research ships operated by NOC. Uh, they have on board the Ranger 2 system. Uh, so that means that the ship can uh, geolocate, georeference the, the subs, as long as the sub are equipped with this device. That's how we use the USB-L system to um, aid the navigation system on board of the vehicle, as well as extracting a little bit of information uh, with, respect, with respect to the sub. Um, so a full integrated system, including the ships and all the vehicles. Fantastic. So the Avtrak talks to the AEV, gives it its position and then that feeds into what we're just about to talk about the sprint nav that's correct so you've got a sprint nav 700 on this vehicle that's correct yeah the sprint nav is the main navigation uh, source for this vehicle that aids the navigation system on board um is interactive with the aft track so when um the ship is operating in the vicinity uh of the sub it can push down um uh, position fixes that it gets from the gps so it's hold the chain from the gps into the ship ship into the Ranger 2 system, um, Ranger 2 system into the Avtrak, Avtrak into the Sprint Nav. That's the full chain. Fantastic. And why is the Sprint Nav important to this particular vehicle? Obviously, you're carrying much more powerful sensors, uh, I'm assuming doing lots of survey work with this type of vehicle. So what, what is it that the Sprint Nav brings to the table here? That's correct. Uh, what is important for a world-class AUV is having a really good navigation system. Uh, because when we uh, do surveys, and this can be um, surveys using cameras or multi-beam or side-scan sonar, we fly pretty close to the seabed. 
And so the classic application for a world class AUV is the, what we call a bantic uh, science, so working um, in, close to the seabed. Uh, in this context, it's really important uh, to georeference all this imaging system that we have, so the multi-beam, the side scan, sub-bottom profiler as well as another one, and as well, of course, at the cameras uh, with respect to the environment. Um, one of the key aspects of the, of the Sprint Nav is, of course, is the performance of the navigation that it can offer. Uh, but another important uh, piece of the puzzle is Janus, which is a post-processing tool that is provided by Sonardan that um, it makes possible to back-propagate uh, the navigation and a higher accuracy, uh, back-propagating all the aiding sources received during the mission, including uh, the GPS once the sub is surfaced. Great. Thanks for that really detailed explanation, Alberto. And as I said earlier, we will be putting show notes into this episode. And so we'll be putting show notes around our Sprint Nav, our AvTrack, our USB-L systems, and of course, the Janus Post Processing as well. Right, we're stood now in front of this really interesting looking vehicle. This is the AH1 vehicle. And Alberto, AH1, I understand, stands for Autosub Hover. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. That's correct. Uh, so AH1 is the only hover-capable vehicle uh, that is at the moment in the Autosub family. Um, that means that it can control its, its vertical speed uh, and it can maintain that. Um, so with respect to the ALRs and with respect to Autosub 5, um, that they are um, what we call a flight style AUVs. That means that they need to ke keep themselves propelled into the water in order to maintain that. This vehicle can maintain that on its own. It can control its vertical speed. Additionally, it can rotate on the spot uh, because this is a fully actuated system. Fantastic. And it sounds like a very flexible vehicle for into working in and around that infrastructure and all of that stuff. And this was the first vehicle that you integrated the Sprint Nav Mini onto in the whole family. So tell us a little bit about why you thought the Sprint Nav Mini was the good solution here. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so a classic scenario, uh, operational scenario for this vehicle are um, coastal and littoral waters, um, as well as near infrastructure, like you said, where basically we have a restricted maneuverability. Now, AH1 is a really uh, flexible platform in terms of uh, controlling its position and orientation in space. But in order to operate in such an environment, you really need a really high accurate navigation system. This is used, of course, for navigation purposes, but additionally is also used uh, for uh, georeferencing, all, uh, georeferencing all the uh, images that you collect with the sensors that can be cameras, uh, multi-beam uh, echo sounder or uh, side scan sonar. Great, and all of your vehicles are flexible in terms of the payloads that we can put on board, um, which is really interesting to, to know, I think. And also, I think in terms of this vehicle, it's a development platform you told me earlier? Absolutely, it's an experimental platform. Uh, so it's been out at sea in several trials. So they, we they demonstrated the technology for this. Um, there's uh, a lot of potential for these platforms. Uh, we will look forward to have a uh, new project coming up for this platform. Absolutely, it seems like a really capable platform that, as I say, will have a lot of utility in and around that, in, close into infrastructure and things like that. So I think, yeah, watch this space on this one, I think. Right, we've taken a little walk and we're now stood in front of one of the NOC's auto sub long range vehicles. Um, Alberto, tell us a little bit about how these vehicles operate and the sort of missions they do. Yeah, when we talk about long range vehicles, one of the main problems we need to face is the amount of power that is available in the, in the sub. So, of course, this, this power needs to be used for propulsion, so for getting them, uh, the sub on the move. It uh, needs to be used uh, for science uh, sensors uh, that are collecting data for our scientists. And then, of course, there's a limited amount of power that we can use for navigation and for communication and for operating over the horizons. Uh, we are talking about a vehicle that can stay out for months uh, and they can travel uh, um, thousands of kilometers. So every little contribution to the power is, is, is important. So we need to save as much power as we can where we can. And that's why um, uh, the using the Sprinter Mini is, is one of the, of the good plus of this approach. Okay, and so I guess this really can change the game in t terms of operations at sea because ultimately we can potentially take the ship out of the lo loop, launch from a dock somewhere or a shore somewhere, send it on a long transit out and then go and survey an area. So one of the things that we've been talking about with the uh, NOC over the, over the last year is how we reduce the power requirements in the Sprint Nav Mini. And we're doing some really exciting development work uh, now specifically for the NOC, but that will be available in the market in the new year around separating the power 
between the uh, INS and the DVL within the Sprint Nav Mini. So tell us why that's really important to you. So when you operate over the horizon for really long time, um, you can afford to use, in terms of power, you can afford to use um, uh, INS systems only for a short amount of time. So there are moments in which you need to navigate uh, using the classic dead reckoner problem, using your compass and, and your DVL. And that's what is important about this approach, having the split power version of the Sprint and Mini to select uh, the, the amount of time that we can extract uh, information from the DVL to aid our um, dead reckoner and our um, navigation system. Uh, in different uh, scenarios, in different um, 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 periods of the mission, then we can turn on the full INS system and then can aid the navigation system on board and it can give us um, um, a high quality navigation with a higher accuracy. So I can imagine, for example, when you're transiting to and from a site, so if, you, if you're launched from a shore somewhere, you can just use the DVL uh, for, for that dead reckoning type navigation. And then when you get to a survey site and you need to switch on all of your payload sensors, INS can kick in and support, the, support that mission. Exactly. That's exactly how it works. Uh, long transit can be, can be quite, uh, quite long. I mean, it can last days. Um, of course, the, the, average, the average speed of, of ALR is about 0.6 meters per second. So as you can imagine, can, it can take a lot of time. Then we, when we are on site, uh, where we want to operate, that basically we are probably getting um, uh, an on-surface fix from the GPS, and then we start the mission operating at depth. And that, if uh, we want um, a good high accuracy of the navigation system, this is when we turn on the, the system. Fantastic. But you still really like that small form factor, tightly coupled solution that we're providing within the, within the Sprint Nav Mini. Absolutely. Well, here we are, back where we started. Myself and Alberto have had a good walk around the vehicles. And it's been really interesting to learn about the different vehicles, the different missions they're doing, uh, the different modes of operation, and how navigation and why navigation is really important to these vehicles. I want to start by saying thank you to Alberto. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been really great to have you with us. It's been a privilege on my side uh, having you here with us today. And if you want to know anything more about the AFSA program or NOC in general, please visit our website, uh, our uh, podcast as well, uh, our social media uh, profiles, um, and I see uh, you soon in uh, March 2024 here at NOC. Yes, that's a good point, actually, Alberto. March 2024, the Marine Autonomy and Technology Showcase will be happening here at the NOC in November. If It's a great event. It's been running for, uh, I think this is the 10th year. It's the 10th anniversary, year. yes. So it should be a really good event, uh, hopefully a bit of a celebration. Um, Myself and Alberto are actually both on the delivery committee. We've, re we've reviewed the abstracts recently. Um, I believe the program will probably be out by the time of this podcast. It's going to be quite exciting, I think. Um, do get yourselves along to it if you can get registered. We'll put links to all of the stuff that Alberto's just mentioned, as well as the Matt's conference in our show notes, so you can find it there. So, yep, do please uh, head along to that. I think the only other things to say, really, are thank you to the NOC for facilitating us here today. Um, do hit subscribe on your platform of choice for this podcast. We will keep releasing these periodically throughout the year and onwards. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.